So I want to use this time to signpost some possibilities for change in tertiary education in training, in um, engagement and exchange, and in research and innovation. And then I will focus for the second part of my talk a bit more closely on um, research and innovation, an area that we also explored a bit this afternoon in Project 3's session. Um, and I want to argue for principled policy and practice, which arises from efforts to understand the risks, the power inequalities, and the potential for divergent interpretations in different contexts, in order to articulate positive meanings, in order to identify generative actions, and in order to encourage configurations of responsible thinking, as well as the associated agency and capabilities. In developing these thoughts, I draw on um, research and writing over the past 20 years, but also on the ongoing research on research project, which is part of CGHE, um, and also on a current study um, that happens in parallel, which is a study of responsible knowledge exchange, engagement and impact, and which is funded by the ESRC, IAA and Research Culture, HIFE and Welcome. So I'll start with a very broad definitions, definition of, of tertiary education. Uh, thinking about ecosystems of post-secondary formal and uh, non-formal learning at higher levels of complexities, um, which are offered or are co-created co in very diverse types of organizations, um, some of which may be transnational, some of which may be trans-sectoral or multimodal. Thank you. Um, as the world faces threats and ongoing economic, environmental, sociopolitical, public health and all sorts of challenges, um, education and training, engagement and exchange and research and innovation are very much at the heart of it all in terms of responses that we can think of um, to all of those potential crises. And that's because they are sectors where, um, which are geared towards helping people and communities flourish, towards developing the capabilities and augmenting the knowledge and skills that are required in order to take meaningful um, action in the world. Um, and because of that, because of that perception and, and, and centrality of tertiary education to such responses, there have been many pressures, and the pressures are mounting in countries around the world, to rethink, to reimagine um, tertiary education as a system and the role of tertiary education in relation to other uh, sectors. Um, and to think about how to achieve more integrated, more sustainable, more resilient systems with the capacity to off offer high quality education for all, um, high quality training, research, innovation and exchange, whilst respecting and learning from difference and contributing to reducing inequalities. I'd like to outline some of these challenges that you see um, summarized right now behind me um, before reflecting then on some of the answers that seem to be already emerging. And in doing that, um, I will hopefully pull together some of the threads of the conversations that you've been engaged with in throughout the day um, today as well. So first, the educational and systemic challenge of making teacher, um, 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 teaching, uh, learning, tertiary education more broadly work effectively in the short and in the medium term. That requires solution to all sorts of problems. Problems of policy, about improving connections, about improving parity, whether you like that term or not, um, between different types and different levels of provision about alignment with labor market needs, short-term, longer-term needs, about reducing outcome gaps, uh, building cross-sectoral and global interfaces for the sector, and indeed striking a better balance than we have at the moment between competition and um, collaboration. There are problems of planning, um, improving financing, quality assurance, staff planning, environmental sustainability of tertiary institutions, capacity for research informed practice, and so on. And there are problems of management, improving working conditions, um, improving the system usability and the navigability of the system by diverse uh, participants, be they students, staff, or partners and communities. Um, issues around tackling discrimination, tackling security and safety, 
concerns tackling violence on campus. Issues around integrating digital and disruptive technologies and we are kind of fast moving into an era where we're learning to live with such technologies and regenerative technologies and we're learning the hard way um, across tertiary education. A second set of challenges um, arises from the complexities of aligning tertiary education and training with global, national, regional and local labour markets but also from the changing nature of work, automation, AI, machine learning, net zero, and so on, and from global issues such as securitization um, in education. The demands for increased and sustained relevance have intensified, and that's relevance to current and to future, however we conceive of those um, um, societal aspirations. And this is multi-scalar, again, we no longer think about aspirations within a national boundaries, we no longer think about aspirations within purely local boundaries, but all at the different scales at the same time. Um, I almost cited the title of a recent film, if I could ever remember that title. Um, the global priorities here are key, um, and they're not you know, the big picture outside the sector, uh, things like climate, public uh, health, uh, extremism and so on are very much part of what happens in the everyday life of campuses within the local spaces um, at, at the same time as the global sphere. And to this we had the expectations to constantly be engaged in developing new forms of knowledge, new methods and new models of knowledge co-production and sharing, while also playing a key role in responsible innovation and in upgrading uh, the technological capacities of other sectors, be they commercial, public or civic organisations. So the tertiary landscape has become more hybrid, more interconnected, with many initiatives now at the interface of traditional sectors. Um, but one thing is true um, across I think all contexts, and that is that disparities, inequalities persist. Reducing those inequalities is hard, um, but if we don't do it, the risks are major. The challenge is both internal, in terms of systems of tertiary being internally equitable and inclusive in their own structures and in their own functioning, but it's also contributory in terms of the role that tertiary has to play in reducing broader ongoing and new inequalities, globally, nationally, regionally, and in local communities. And that includes, um, as it has always included, uh, ensuring equ equitable access to education, training, but also knowledge more broadly, research, innovation, engagement, exchange, and to opportunities to develop, and enabling equitable capabilities to imagine, uh, to create, and to act. Operationally, such change requires dealing with barriers, with structural, cultural, and other barriers, which maintain divides among the different parts of the tertiary ecosystem. In particular, tackling entrenched inequalities, such as those between higher education and other higher forms of um, technical and vocational education and training. And indeed, inequalities present within the higher education systems themselves. We also need to acknowledge the cultural rootedness of education, training, research and innovation, of their practices, policies and governance, the different positionalities um, involved in interpreting the global in relation to these functions and, the, and, and of, with the goods associated with them, the legacy of ongoing uh, impact of epistemic and linguistic hegemonies relative to the diversity of worldviews that tertiary education and research can express and ought to express. Now, if we look at lower income settings, um, and I've just been in a session in which we discussed some of those aspects, the problems are compounded by even sharper outcome gaps, even more inequitable, potentially, representation in decision making, including on the global stage, even more inequitable access to resources, even more acute financial instability of institutions, infrastructural gaps and decay, consequences 
um, that perhaps are fe felt more acutely of uh, corruption, malpraxis, but also of externally extractive and exploitative relationships, acute lack of teaching and of research capacity, widening gaps between international employment returns and the development of locally relevant graduate skills, and the consequences and implications of global divides, colonial histories, economic, cultural and linguistic hegemonies and geopolitical inequalities and tensions. Put these together and we have a tiered system at the global level whereby we all share in the challenges and recognize them in different configurations. But the brand of those challenges is probably borne disproportionately by settings with the lowest level of resources. So, what might be possibilities for answering those challenges? Um, again, answers that are not just efficient, uh, but answers that are more, more importantly responsible. Some of those answers sit with the system, and they sit with trying to ensure more efficient integration across the different functions, across education, training, research, innovation, engagement, and exchange trying to create um, cross-sectoral and, and global collaboration interfaces um, and trying to realign and redefine the interfaces with labour markets, community, civic society and leisure. Within systems themselves, um, there is, the time has passed already when we had to urgently address uh, issues arising from the inequitable distribution of high quality provision and, and opportunities. Um, and issues around the working environment and conditions um, for staff within tertiary, which needs to reflect the agency and the demands of the teaching prof of the tertiary professions, and to be non-exploitative and fair. But beyond um, um, this particular take on things, which is more efficiency-oriented than responsibility-oriented, the answer is. Um, broader. Uh, remember the definition that I, that I started with um, of those ecosystems, where these ecosystems combine um, systems um, of um, knowledge and sign, generation, um, connection, interpretation, sharing. They combine values and norms um, that make cultures tick. And they combine different types of structures and agents, and agents so beings, and material um, practices and support that make the reality of tertiary education. So for change, for positive change, responsible change to happen, all of these components need to be mobilized in certain ways. Otherwise, we will end up changing one mechanism and then the values do not align with that, so we end up with more performative, more unequal, more inequitable ways um, of working. So if we look at the answers that have been explored in relation to education and training, a lot of them are just responsive. You know, something happens, technological advancements, changes in the world, geopolitical shocks, and tertiary education really quickly follows trying to adapt, trying to make some some changes and tweaks in order to continue to, to function. Others are more fundamental um, changes and they involve rethinking perhaps the expectations and the aims of, of education, of tertiary education. Um, and I'm suggesting here a way of kind of conceiving of those, of that configuration of aims for tertiary education, which combine, revolves around the idea of equitable, equitably distributed capabilities and combines the capability to imagine and to create and bring about desired livelihoods with personally meaningful life experiences and with democratic participation to civic and to public life. Some of elements of this have already been um, incorporated in kind of rethinking discourses about higher education in particular in terms of um, self-formation, in terms of responsible economic, civic and political participation, in terms of contributing to multi-scale uh, problems including planetary 
Um, but I am yet to see kind of concerted um, discussion and concerted efforts in kind of trying to really acknowledge all of these elements when we think about what tertiary education is for um, and how you can make a difference for the good in the world. One level down from that, there are, and I was saying, very responsive, very kind of passive sometimes changes to curriculum, pedagogy and assessment, which sometimes reflect with the time lag, the transformations that happen in the, in the broader world. Um, there are lots of attempts now to um, um, engage in decolonization of curriculum or spaces of pedagogies to um, in, uh, make more space for interdisciplinarity and multimodality within uh, tertiary education, to um, co-design uh, pa and, and uh, participatory models of learning with students, with employers and with uh, communities to introduce and, and cultivate assessment for learning and assessment for capabilities, um, and to adapt um, using hi hybrid and asynchronous ways of learning um, and establish new relationships with technology. And in parallel with that, and perhaps the list for me would be much harder to, to rattle off now, there are discourses and attempts to really rethink the ways in which we conceive of participation and the ways in which we're thinking about turning sometimes ups and down on themselves the, the uh, flows of power that make tertiary education what it is now. Engagement and exchange, um, I always list this one as a function of, of tertiary education, as you can see, alongside education and training and research and innovation. And that's not um, uh, just because funding schemes might invite us to do so, or just because it's nice to think that we make a difference kind of beyond looking inwardly. But it's also because we have a very large workforce and we have a very large set of commitments <laughs> Um, and, and um, values that are connected with this and which have been connected with this um, from the, the, the very early days of tertiary education of different kinds. I'm not talking just about um, higher education. Um, so changes, ongoing changes in, in relation to this function um, include um, the focus on planetary threats and the awareness of them in the everyday um, interactions and practices in institutions as well as um, co-creation, student participation, partnership with um, civil society and, and economic agents, um, social entrepreneurship, uh, public engagement and that reach and so on. And on to research and innovation. And as I was saying, I will dwell a bit longer on, on this um, aspect um, in the rest of my talk. Um, we can already see the diversification of forms and of um, agents of knowledge involved not just in higher education, even though that has been the topic of much CG research over the past eight years, but across all of the different levels and types of tertiary provision. Um, there we can see already fluid boundaries between the different domains and of, of knowledge. We can see um, how polycentric networks of knowledge have um, emerged and, and, and function, and we can see how polycentric networks for sharing knowledge are functioning. We heard earlier today about Scopus and about Clarivate and so on, established databases. Um, I work with colleagues who are involved in um, a very large scale, very interesting database which has been established in Latin America and it's um, um, not in, uh, for research necessarily published in English. Um, and it's very um, um, enthusiastically supported across um, Latin America um, and very valuable as a resource um, as well. We see a co-creation and kind of new innovative partnerships popping up all the time. We see an emphasis on team science and an emphasis on open knowledge and on, on mission and sustainable development oriented research and so on. Now, I want to pause on that. Because in a talk like this, and um, in policy reform and institutional leadership and so on, um, it's important to acknowledge that when we say those things, we come from certain positions. Um, and they are likely to be positions of privilege in a context like this. Um, and a lot of work and a lot of humility is still needed to truly see this um, and to learn more respectful ways of being a contributor to tertiary research and innovation, domestically and globally. 
And it's also important to ask who is not part of these conversations, you know, who is not in this room this evening. Um, and more broadly, who is not part of the ongoing reforms and the ongoing reviews of research governance, of research evaluation around the world. There are important blind spots in the existing frameworks um, and, and mechanisms for the governance of research and innovation. And they include, for example, issues around data availability and data sovereignty beyond the context of the UK or of high-income nations. Issues around the cultural and spiritual integrity, for example, of indigenous communities engaged in research. Issues around the cultural and contextual rootedness of definitions of research quality. Issues around equity, um, and we addressed some of these today in the previous session, um, equity in defining who counts um, as a researcher and who is recognized for their research contributions. Issues around understanding how quality, research and innovation quality, um, uh, how it's, um, it's undergirding by um, structural inequalities. Um, issues around the linguistic and cultural hegemonies that may be embedded in research framing practices such as indexing, assessment, ranking, databases, publishing, peer review and so on, whereby culturally situated meanings of research, of quality and of the good may be marginalized and suppressed. And this also applies to the level of knowledge agents where systems of recognition and resource allocation may obscure old and new forms of inequality and, justice, and injustice. Um, and that includes, for example, uh, things as simple as um, the gaps between specialist career tracks and precarious works, work that one of my colleagues discussed today, um, or those are arising from unfair epistemic treatment, from hermeneutic um, injustices, such as the silencing, misrepresentation, systematic distortion, instrumentalization or undermining of diverse knowledge agents. The systems for assessing, indexing, recognizing and selective resourcing of research that span very diverse contributions may therefore be very opaque to research that could be exploitative, extractive, exclusionary or epistemically unjust. And I think that awareness of these four E's um, and of other equally dangerous ingredients is a prerequisite of better informed and more just decisions about future research and innovation systems. The um, project that I mentioned earlier on, the ongoing CG project on research on research, um, has explored some of this diversity with our participants from around the world in terms of knowledge agents, um, individual, collective, with different identities, careers, organizations, geographies, um, epistemic contributions, ontological and normative distinctiveness. Um, also in terms of different modes and types of research with their distinctive descriptors, and in terms of different domains of research defined as cultural and inter, multi or disciplinary communities. So how may more principled approaches to research policy, governance and practice which serve this diversity better, how may they be realized? Well, there is already growing momentum, I can say that, at the, that first level on this slide. So the aspirational, advisory and um, um, exhortative um, level. There are, for example, multiple principles and declarations and statements and initiatives which are aimed at stimulating more responsible approaches to research. Um, and I won't go into detail in, for, for, on, on all of these, but I would be very happy to engage afterwards and, and, and have a conversation about um, what's in them, the drivers behind them, but also the kind of take up and the um, um, differential um, level of implementation across the world. Um, so because, um, and, and I won't look at them, also partly because um, I want to share with you um, one such initiative that I am part of. Um, and that's part of the project that I was mentioning earlier, the Responsible Knowledge Exchange Engagement and Impact Project, in which we're trying to develop, co-develop with a broad range of partners, um, a framework that extends consideration of responsible practice from the planning, the conduct, the sharing of R&I, 
to that other domain that I was talking about, so to responsible knowledge exchange, engagement and impact. And this framework, uh, unsurprisingly, includes ethics and integrity. Um, and it's very interesting that, albeit in many knowledge exchange and such projects, ethical reflection may happen informally and may be prompted by partners. Often it is not supported by um, dedicated training or resources. And in international and cross-sectoral exchanges, there may be differences in how the different communities or relevant parties may define and prioritize ethical issues. Um, and indeed, ethical training itself, even if it is part of these projects, may be grounded in Western knowledge systems and in very specific uh, cultural protocols. Second, equity, diversity and inclusion has become increasingly visible, not just in broader organizational policies and in relation to career stages and so on, um, but also in relation to you know, who gets involved in, in knowledge exchange and who gets recognized for that work and in, in which ways. Uh, for example, in credit um, attribution frameworks. And there are power asymmetries and barriers that can exclude different individuals and teams from knowledge exchange and from the shaping of um, future practice. Third, sustainability and reciprocity, and that's with reference to meaningful and lasting benefits to the communities that are involved in knowledge exchange and in impact interactions, to the avoidance of negative externalities and also obviously to sustainable, um, sustainability, environmental sustainability. Um, and I, I, out of curiosity, um, I looked I, um, at some of the participants' um, engagements with projects uh, that declared themselves as knowledge exchange projects. I asked a simple question, you know, to what extent did you take carbon footprint into account when you designed the different activities? Um, I can't remember the proportion, but it was incredibly low, even on something quite as basic as that. Um, there's also still much to be learned, so if that's an issue, there's a lot to be learned um, on things about the reach, the longevity, the sustainability of community-based resources that may be shared in unequal relationships in knowledge exchange initiatives, um, and also about the potential for friction and, con and, and conflict that may exist in these interactions. Fourth, we look at contextual sensitivity across different cultures, but also across different experiential contexts, and we ask what level of reciprocity is built into these interactions, what mechanisms for listening and reading contextual information are being put in place, what interactions are respectful and meaningful and seen as such by the different parties involved, how epistemically just are those interactions, whose interests and whose worldviews and interpretive resources are being prioritized in selecting contextual information on which to act. And then the open knowledge agenda, that's an interesting one because it applies to research very broadly, but um, our participants insist that it doesn't apply to knowledge exchange and engagement quite in the same way. Uh, one of our participants said, sometimes the most responsible choice is not to share. And that's to protect participants, especially vulnerable beneficiaries, to sustain trust, to protect commercial sensitivity and so on. And I agree, this is indeed a domain where nuance is required. However, critical consideration of the reasons of, and values of choosing between either openness or confidentiality in these interactions is absolutely important. And then finally, um, a comment on how um, support and recognition for knowledge exchange and impact activity is unevenly distributed within institutions and systems, potentially reinforcing patterns of inequity. Um, contributions in, these, in this domain are not consistently recognized. Although a move towards narrative CVs and broader criteria for recruitment and promotion of researchers and for assessment of research and so on may help address this issue to some extent, they may not differentiate between more or less responsible ways of doing knowledge exchange and, and impact. Remember the four E's that I mentioned earlier. So back to you know, how do we make more principled research policy, governance and practice um, a reality. I talked about you know, exhortation and, and advice. There is regulation and there are incentives and lots of different codes and standards and concordats and so on are being um, committed to and, and introduced. Um, there are initiatives to reform research funding, research evaluation, research communication and so on. But from that to actually get to changing the way in which accountability um, is, is offered and changing research practices and cultures, there's still a few 
more steps to take. So what are the options to change some of the um, non or less responsible patterns that um, are still visible? Well, we can tweak. We can tweak the ref and similar system. We can do minor adjustments to levels of funding and along the streams that exist. We can create bridging funds. We can create allowances for special circumstances, compensatory schemes. We can create more special funds for short-term fixes such as APC, grant writing consultancies and so on. We can create and refine more reactive tools to police the use of technology, to police non-traditional practices. We can build increasingly detailed workload planning systems. But we end up with something which is a bit more of the same, just more complex to navigate, with heavier burden and with more space for bureaucracy. We can, of course, replace. We can radically reform. We can move to resourcing based of, on ex-ante indicators. We can change the financing for publication and data infrastructure. We can make funding conditional on collaboration. We can pivot research assessment to metrics, as indeed it's um, being considered in Australia and other parts of the world. Or we can pivot it to self-evaluation and formative assessment. We can push career tracks into a convergent direction, or indeed we can create multiple pathways of comparable reward and conditions. Um, and we can explore um, a lot more, far less palatable um, options. But then again, any of these would have to be a viable alternative. We would need to build trust, we would need to build co evidence, quality of evidence, um, and ultimately the principles uh, behind the whole thing are not challenged. Um, and if the principles are not challenged, remember what I was saying earlier about knowledge and agents and structures and, um, and values and norms. If not all of these come together, then we can simply create space for just different and narrower performativity. And we can indeed stop. We can stop performance-based distribution of resources on the basis of retrospective assessments of research. We can stop publishing in, non, in uh, for-profit outlets. We can stop competitive allocation of funding through single blind peer review. We can stop project-based research budgeting and staff planning, therefore stopping recruitment to short-term, fixed-term and casual research positions, and so on. And of course there are downsides to that as well. We would need to come up with viable alternatives, we would need to come up with resources, we would need to build a trust. Otherwise, again, we risk to simply create a space for arbitrariness. So, the past few decades of research policy have seen, and many argue, the ascension of formal accountability. And many describe this situation as rampant, competitive accountability and so on. I like to call it performative accountability. The role played by systems of recognition, credit assessment and selectivity in performance accountability is expressed to a versatile balance of powerful practices, which include rituals and routines that affect institutional life to the point at which they become conditional of professional autonomy in tertiary education. But I like to contrast this conceptual constellation, which you know, to some extent is a bit of a straw man, um, of performative accountability with a different one, and that's that of generative accountability. I think of both concepts as ideal types, right? Why performative accountability may be formal, mandatory, summative, hierarchical, metricized, adversarial, in contrast, the more generative understanding of accountability may be collective, voluntary, formative, horizontal, co-produced, inclusive, and democratic. And with this latter vocabulary, we may begin to imagine the implications for researchers' perceived freedoms to enact epistemic virtues such as integrity, openness, modesty, circumspection of all criticality, um, as opposed to corralling their sense of responsibility into performative compliance with role expectations. So I hope I've mounted an argument today that the options for change currently open to the various reform initiatives all come with both affordances and risks. Discontinuing everything is of course an option, although it leaves open the potential for arbitrariness and the question of what the viable alternatives might look like and how to acknowledge any efforts that have already been put 
and careers that have been given to um, conforming, complying with the existing systems. Fully planned, radical reforms may enable a consultative process, but you will be faced with the challenges of building trust and quality in a new system, particularly if the principles of concentration and competition are not challenged. And finally, changing within, tweaking within the existing parameters might increase burden without addressing the important issues. So I'll finish by iterating a key point. Reimagining tertiary is not just a drop, keep, tweak exercise. And it's not just a techno-political exercise in identifying and perfecting indicators and mechanisms and calibration methods to enable performative accountability. And just because it hap they had these things happen to be the best compromise currently available amongst stakeholder groups. I think it's more importantly also an opportunity to work towards principled generative accountability, which is to enact principles of justice, openness, care and integrity, intellectual freedom and support for critical academic professionalism, epistemic diversity, support for different modes of research, including those that are at odds with current political agendas, and drawing on the ever stronger research on research base. By enacting these principles, a reimagined um, research and, and innovation enterprise might strive towards more formative, more communicative, more epistemically just, and more morally defensible forms of, forms of accountability. So thank you so much for listening, and please keep in touch. Before I finish, I would like to acknowledge the teams that contribute, contributed to the two ongoing projects that I mentioned earlier. Here they are. Um, and some of those colleagues are in the room now with my warmest thanks. Um, and I also like to thank Arjia Habibi who provided the artwork that I have used in this uh, presentation. And here are some links um, on how you could keep connected as well as some pointers to upcoming publications and in particular to the forthcoming handbook of meta research which I'm co-editing with, again with colleagues in the room. Thank you very much. And thank you, Alice. Um, thank you very much indeed. You've given us um, tools and methods with which to reimagine tertiary education from the ground up. Um, and um, that, I think, will, will resonate through our work for the next few years. Um, I, I really like generative accountability. I thought that was really persuasive and that, and that we can take into the, the formal and policy spaces and the institutional um, management spaces with some hope, I think, of, of it being taken seriously and making a difference. Uh, and that's only one thing that you gave us today. Um, the, I was going to ask you to step at, to start the discussion, step outside the research area specifically, and although not entirely, I think, and, and, and perhaps talk to us about tertiary education and work. Um, the, I mean, I think we're, we're facing a difficult situation where the um, the knowledge-rich uh, learning and cultural formation process that we're engaged in at its best um, is not necessarily comfortable with a, uh, a firm and universal employability agenda, sort of the notion that what we're really about is job-ready graduates, as one government calls it, um, and that we can value education quite, quite formally and instrumentally in terms of its labour market outcomes and so on. Um, I mean, if we reimagine education and work, you know, how would, how, what would we do there? What would be some of the tools and methods that we might bring to bear on that task? That's a really big question. Thank you, um, Simon. I won't presume to answer this question um, for everyone, um, given the wealth of expertise in this room and the discussions that you had today. Uh, but I want to share a quick um, kind of anecdotal <laughs> Uh, I think. Um, I'm very familiar with a very small village um, which has been constantly depopulated over the past maybe 50 years. Um, so now there's maybe about 300 people living in it, out of whom there are about 10 um, young people. Um, all of the discussions that we have around employability, about opportunities that are not so on, somehow render the lives of individuals in this village irrelevant. 
And I think that by focusing exclusively on this agenda and forgetting that what I was saying earlier, that um, education is about being able to imagine, to create, and to live, to bring about your desired livelihood and your personally meaningful experiences. By forgetting that, I think we're forgetting something really, really crucial. Uh, so yes, we can, um, as I was saying earlier, we can tweak, we can radically change, and we can stop doing things the way we do. We can stop any degree program, we can stop any provision of, of TVET that we have, we can you know, reinvent other things. But it's down to those individual and community-based trajectories and experiences where it becomes really real and really tough. Okay, who would like to come in at this point? David, yes. Thank you. Yeah, very good question, David. Um, I, I, I said that I'm thinking of them as ideal types um, um, in the conceptual sense, not in the aspirational sense. Um, and I also said that I think performative accountability or what others have called rampant competitiveness, competitive accountability and so on, is a bit of a straw man to a, to, to a great extent. Because there's elements of both um, in how we live our lives. We are not uh, behaving in, the, in a completely irrational manner, kind of, Sub submitting uh, to uh, completely unreasonable demands. There's, uh, there's throwing and throwing going on there between different types of value commitments that are mobilized by different parts of the, of the accountability regime. So I do think that there are, there are mixes of both. But I think maybe the time has come to move more into the direction of generative um, accountability and to make it possible to talk about principles and values uh, without having to apologize for that. Wonderful ex we've seen some wonderful examples f from you today about giving voice to others, giving credit to your collaborators, and I want to thank you for that. I want to ask you, how do you navigate being who you are as a researcher with the principles you want to see the research have, um, but still navigating the world we are in? What do you do as a researcher to make it easier for the people you work with, for your participants, giving voice to others, in this imperfect system? Thank you. Well, that's probably the hardest question of all. Um, first of all, I would say that I don't give a voice. Um, I think I shut up occasionally and listen to the voices around me, um, many of which make more sense than me. And I think for us, starting from that position where we acknowledge that actually, um, there are others whose voice perhaps matters more and makes more sense um, is a really good starting point. Um, I don't give voice to participants as well. What participants give is a gift. Um, so I owe them a debt of gratitude um, and I owe them that kind of listening so that when I put something, when I commit something to, to paper, I commit it um, to paper in a responsible way. Um, we can talk about kind of concrete things as well that, that, that one can do. But I think all of these things have risks. Um, and we're non-perfect humans in non-perfect systems. Um, and I think just come, come clean about where you're coming from and the positionality that you have and the limits around what you are doing and, and, and really emphasize the listening skills. And the usual way of these things, speakers, uh, Questions are now coming forward. So, um, Lily, Lily's next on the call list. Lily Yang. Thank you. Uh, in my view, that um, when we talk about research practice, um, particularly in relation with uh, in relation to diversity, it's not only about research; it's also about the education um, system. For example, the research I'm working on uh, that I interviewed with, uh, I interviewed um, 
scholars who have uh, who have Chinese background, and what they are sharing is that their knowledge structure is largely uh, influenced by the education that we, they went through, uh, particularly in humanities and social sciences, and that what kind of knowledge they received as a student, um, and also the kind of legitimate knowledge that are, they are still experiencing at the, glo at the, at, at the global level, as particularly like globally visible research. Um, but that when we talk about diversity, how could we engage with a formal education system that we um, invite more sort of different kinds of knowledge and different kinds of epistems into our knowledge system that we um, nurture our researchers and also researchers them, um, themselves together to work on building a more uh, diversified uh, knowledge uh, practice uh, system that um, can create and promote the true diversity of, um, of, of research and knowledge. Okay, I don't have an answer. Um, that gets me out of the problem partly. Um, but I think um, most of the things that I said about research and, and innovation also apply to education, although in slightly different ways, to education and training and to um, engagement um, and exchange. Uh, but I think the issue is earlier, uh, probably, than tertiary. Um, so thinking about um, engaging the fuller range of, of knowledges um, and the fuller range of experiences in, into tertiary um, has implications for how we train um, teachers for pre-tertiary, has implications for how we conceive of the aims of pre-tertiary and, and so on. Um, I don't think we can kind of suddenly make a decision that, you know, today, um, from today onwards, I am going to be, you know, an open institution and, and so on. That doesn't kind of quite work that way. Now, in different contexts, there has been such attempt. Um, and, but what they've ended up with um, often is a, is a tracked system. Um, and in the project that I was describing earlier, we made a conscious decision, for example, to um, look at different disciplinary departments in different types of institutions in the six um, uh, international contexts that we're studying. But in addition to that, to also look at institutions that describe, them, describe themselves as having a, a, cult a mission which is led culturally or, or by, by community. Mission, missions, and they include, for example, departments and faculties which look at um, indigenous research and so on. Um, and it's, it's very problematic when, when we look at those systems to kind of try and navigate um, across what ends up being um, silos um, and, and without, without the right kind of communication between them. And that's not something that is just specific to certain countries. We have four systems that we've looked at um, with very different histories, very different um, kind of cultural makeup, where the same problem has arisen. Next is Diana. Where's Diana? Well, thank you, Alice. Um, oh, great, thank you. Um, that was terrific. And um, you set us a, an interesting challenge with your generative accountability. And we've been sitting here comparing what we're trying to do in our part of CG which is developing the model for large-scale collaborative professional development to address, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, I think we can answer to every single one of those features that you represent. So you set us the challenge now of writing a new working paper for CG to try measure up to what, what you're offering here. But I'm intrigued to know, how did you generate those two lists? How did you go about that process? Thank you. Um, there's two elements, at least, well, two elements to it. Um, one is, um, as you would expect, empirical research. Um, so looking at um, doing research on research um, over a long period of time and kind of trying to understand the kind of governance mechanisms and accountability mechanisms within that. Um, and the other is um, uh, reflection, kind of informed by a bit of a philosophical background to try and, and, and look at models of um, more intelligent models of, of accountability than perhaps what may be practiced in, in very specific institutions at any given point in time. So there is conceptual work that is kind of based on also of some empirical research, which I can explain in detail which, which areas of research kind of led me to, to reflect in this. But 
Um, maybe that's outside. Do you want the paper yes, yes. So I can I can share. There's um, there's a 2019 paper and there's an earlier I think 2007 paper that I can I can share because they're both open access. Mm. Yeah. Next is Nick. Thank you. Um, despite being a, a crass economist, I love the vision that you paint. Um, I've got two practical questions. One is, given the increase in diversity of the sector, how well does it play out across that diversity? Second, and I think more serious, we're back against the problem that Alison Wolf painted this morning. You talk about trust. Trust is intangible, it can't be measured. The Treasury wants measurable indicators of accountability. And how can we fight back against that? I think generative accountability is, is not lack of accountability. Yeah. Um, and I think some of the measures that we use now are not intrinsically um, the, the, the source um, of performative compliance and so on. Um, I'm going back to that kind of early diagram that I had, which had structures and agents, knowledge and, and signs, and um, values and norms. And I think it's the intersection of all of those different things um, and the configuration of them within specific um, political, economic, cultural settings, such as the UK, that may be conducive um, to particular forms of accountability taken over um, um, and becoming a priority. And I think here we've had a lengthy history now of, of decades um, in which we have uh, reinforced the use of particular technologies and, and mechanisms that I associate with performative accountability. But that doesn't mean that they cannot be re changed, reframed and remobilized um, for different configurations of values and principles. One last question. Uh, thank you. Is how this uh, alternative model of accountability could be possible in a world that is struggling between, uh, uh, for example, China and US, these two big powers that are fighting against each other, and also you have a correlation of geopolitical forces, one supporting the US, the other supporting China, and with these uh, national systems, not only the, of education, but also of economics, of different areas of the countries, fighting against each, against each other, uh, how these alternative local visions could, could, could emerge. And even that, uh, for example, in the Global South, Latin American Global South, many indigenous uh, groups or are also fighting against uh, essentializing their, their uh, worldviews, how also this could be marketized, how these, these worldviews could be marketized. And also they are more fighting for a more economic rights, like to have a, an access to education, a public service, something more an, at an economic level and not of an, an alternative worldview that is uh, even criticized by, by the own indigenous, indigenous communities. Thank you, you've got more than one question there. There's quite a few <laughs> questions there. So I think with the big picture um, question, yes, it's complicated. And yes, there's high risks and there's geopolitical tensions that, you know, and, and potential unexpected crises like COVID as that can take over, um, you know, all of our attempts to do things. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't start with, you know, what's in our own kind of backyard. Um, and there are certain practices that we can change tomorrow um, in, in the way in which we we interact with students, with, with partners, with communities, with other researchers, with colleagues, and so on. There are practices that you know, we could have changed yesterday, but you know, there's the comfort of them. So that's, that, for, the, for the global picture, I think you know, if we are to start small, it's a bit like recycling. If we are to start small, at least we start um, somewhere rather than being paralyzed by the bigger picture. Um, but the other point that you made about indig uh, again, I can't presume to speak with any authority about those matters because of my positionality, right? 
but I have seen in the, in the interactions that we've had on, on the different projects that I'm, I'm involved in, um, I have seen those tensions, you know, around universalization, around essentializing, around um, uh, kind of parceling up um, what seem to be um, important themes, um, such as indigenous knowledges and the diversity of and, and alternative um, worldviews and so on, and then using them to, to, to virtue signal. Um, and I think, again, that's something that we need to bring to the open and that we, we kind of need to challenge. Will everyone put their hands together and thank Alice very much for that session.